recording now. So uh, I would like to welcome everyone to the Second Street Bay Team Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Second Stream Debate Team Podcast. As always, I am Javin. I'm Alex. Jay, say your name. One of you two at the bottom. <laughs> go ahead and say something every time. I don't know what, I don't know what order we go. We, 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 every time, we never talk about it. Go. <laughs> All right. It's going to go, it's going to go me, it's going to go me, Alex, Seth, Jace, okay? <laughs> Say it again. It's gonna go me, Alex, Seth, Jace. Okay. <sighs> and then Alex will introduce you. Do you yes. Or Jarvis. Uh, I mean, it, it depends. Like, I usually just go by Jarvis with most people. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Sounds good. All right. Ready. <laughs> so I'm at. Welcome to another episode of the Second String Debate Team podcast. As always, I'm Javin. I'm Alex. Jace? What the fuck? <laughs> Dude. Uh, anyways, that's... Hey, uh, that's what you guys get for not, not figuring this out. Also, uh, we're also joined by our guest today, Christopher Jarvis. Uh, he's a longtime friend of mine, someone who's worked in the film industry, 3D animation, also is a farmer now, so we brought him on to talk to you guys about all that fun stuff. I love how you just were sort of like, he is a farmer now. He's a, well, yeah, hey man, he's, he's got all those credentials. Yeah, I mean, he threw a notch on the belt just for this podcast, so. That's true. Yeah, he started farming just for this podcast, people. Mm-hmm. That's how dedicated he is. Hey. Kind of guess we have to He's like the Christian Bale of podcasting. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I want to kick this off real quick because, again, like I said, I think this would be a good time for both Seth and Jace to to ask you, Jarvis, about um, you know maybe some of the cool stuff you learned in film school, or maybe any advice, especially since Jace is just getting into art school. You know, like because you know you remember Paka, right? Like I would actually. I would consider Paco one of the more influential teachers I've ever had. Not necessarily in terms of any technical skill, but he taught me to be able to answer the question, why, to three levels deep. You know, like, why are you doing something in all of your pieces? And I'm, I'm curious if there's, if you have any tips or tricks or, you know, thoughts of that when, when approaching going to art school and stuff like that that you may have picked up. Well, so... So I went to Full Sail University. It was kind of, it's, I went for their 3D, their computer animation program. And it's a little bit of art, but also still very technical. So, you know, we learned a lot of fundamentals. We learned a lot of software. Every month was just a rigorous, you know, gone, whatever projects we ended up having. Um, but I think the, the biggest takeaway that I had from, from that school by the time I was done wasn't necessarily how to do my job well, per se. You learn that on the job, but how to learn you learn how to learn. And as long as you can do that, you can always stick at least relevant or on top of whatever's changing. You know, they, they tra really trained us to more or less keep up with the industry that changes so quickly also like really instill a lot of those fundamentals so it's a great school if you just want to if you're a workaholic too. yeah <laughs> so you would, so would you say like um i guess just to rephrase what you said it was uh they, they taught you more how to think about thinking is that kind of what you were saying it kind of like they gave us the problems and told us, they showed us what we needed to know, right? But they also, in the labs, 
allowed time for us to like explore. Like we would open labs sometimes four o'clock in the morning and we would go crazy hours. But you know, when you're in that kind of mindset with other people, you're all bringing a, a different view of the same thing to the table. So you all kind of like, it creates for learning or anything. Uh, well, that really is kind of what. Yeah, I think that sounds kind of interesting because I mean, especially Jason, Jab, since you guys have been in the military, it seems kind of a little bit like that. You're produced, you, you're thrown into an environment where everybody's kind of working towards the same goal in one way, shape, or form, you know? Yeah. So I have a question then. Did you find that while you're going through school, did you find that there was more of a community or a competition mindset when it came to your peers? Because it sounds like it was more of a community, the fact that you would stay up till 4 a.m. having a blast learning stuff. Like, you probably didn't have to stay up that late, but you did anyway. Yeah, it's, you, you really get... You really get comfortable like sleeping on benches outside of class and <laughs> just random places around the hallway. But no, I mean, it's, when everybody's there for the same thing, the people that are dedicated to what they're doing and like learning, because it's, it's an expensive school and it's it's just a difficult industry to get into in its own right. Um, so it, it, seriously. Just like anything, I think you'll be successful. And you'll find other people that have the same mindset, and those people just kind of like come together. Yeah. Uh, organically. I yeah. That's um, cool. So I have a question actually for Jarvis and Alex. Alex, you had said, um, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember your teacher's name, but he had taught you to answer the question why to three levels deep. I've, I'm not familiar yeah. with that phrase. What exactly does that mean? So, and I don't even know, if, his name was Potka, and I don't even know if he was actually intentionally trying to teach, like, teach that, but and maybe Jarvis had a different experience, but when I went through class with him in Art AP, which was the advanced placement art class, uh, every week you would have to put up a, a piece of work on a Wednesday for a midterm review, and then Friday was a final review for your piece. And I always remember, like, if, if I drew something or painted something, Paco would ask you, like, well, why did you put that there? Why is that element in the painting? And at first, I think like a lot of art kids, you kind of bullshit your way through it and you just kind of make up things because you don't, you weren't actually thinking about that. Um, but the more he would ask you why and you would give him an answer, he would basically respond with, well, why did you do that? And he basically, he would stop asking you if you gave him a satisfactory answer after about three. So that's kind of where I picked up the why three levels deep. Like if you're doing something, you know, you, you need to know why you're doing it. Like just because you put like an orange bouncy ball in a scene, uh, you better have a reason for why you're putting it there. And then what's the reason for it being there? And like, why was it there? now versus beforehand or afterhand it's just it's like thinking about the dynamics of the scene that you're producing or the work artwork you're producing um and i'm sure drivers can talk about that too because it's really important in, in 3d work that like, you have to know why you're doing it especially with the time frame that it takes to create these pieces yeah and i i think it goes like a little bit further than just artwork as well like um so when I started, I was a terrible programmer. I like barely touched computers. I was the worst. I was that guy. <laughs> but uh, you know, like when you realize like why you're doing something, like even say writing a line. Of, I had a my biggest name was Mike Clavin, was the Python instructor full sales time, and he asked me. I was having a hard time trying to wrap my head around coding. Um, and that's kind of like a lot of what I do now with applying TV and, you know, software. Uh, think of it, like before you touch that brush to the, the canvas, you're doing something. You're touching it there for a reason. You put that color on your brush for a reason. And like to meticulously like write down before you touch it to the canvas, write down what you're doing. 
write down why you're doing it. And you approach an application in a similar way. You know, you have your your wireframe set up your from your app or your website or whatever you're building, and you put every line of code in that application with the and then you don't have a lot of like fluff and dead code and just stuff that is not hot. The painting can be the same way. Do you or, think do you think there's a lot of people, a lot of artists that feel different though to where I, I <laughs> excuse me, like um like spontaneity is more important than anything else. Cause I hear that from a lot of different, um, different people involved in the arts is like just that sometimes it's that spontaneous, like, um, you know, what's the, what's the cliche, uh, lightning in a bottle or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, do you think that the two elements kind of coincide? Like you need to have an intention, but there's also a little room for, you know, like, uh, you know, I guess, yeah, spontaneity. Yeah, I mean, I, I think every every artist has their own approach to something, and everybody sees something different and has their own style. And I think that spontaneity that you're referring to is kind of like their own interpretation of how they approach that. Like, I may, like, say if I'm doing something, I may think of it as one way, but another person, you know, might think of it as different. And it just it's just how you perceive, I guess, at that point. That's what gives the artists, I think, their own unique style. Like, it's never going to go Right. And I would, you know, I think I would agree with that, too. And just in, uh, but there's, a, I think, maybe a difference in maybe what you were alluding at, Jarv, or Jace. I'm not, ah, Jab. I told you this is going to get confused. <laughs> Jab, uh, which is, like, maybe that, that super high-end artist those people who are like, oh, I just turned a toilet into a water fountain because that's art, blah, blah, blah. And as much as those people even want to say that it's kind of like spontaneous art or it's like a middle finger to the art world, they're still doing it with intention. Like, you don't, like, even if you don't like modern art, there is a level of intention with what they do, mm -hmm. you know? Like, even if you want to talk about Jackson Pollock and him throwing paint on a canvas, um, there is intention with it. Granted, he was drunk as fuck, but there was an, a certain level of intention to it. It wasn't that he just went out there and threw a can of paint on a canvas and called it art. Mm -hmm. And that, and that same, with that same thing, is there's so many niches to art, and it's unreal that, you know, one thing that could be such a simple little... Uh, detail like what you were talking about earlier about the intentions it, it could be a complete different world for one type of artist compared to another and they could be drawing you you could give them a, a, a framework like you were going to draw about this and you could you'll get two different pieces you know so yeah. so all that is 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 so big it is and it's awesome and it's one of those things that i'm appreciating you going through class and seeing your work because you're picking up on that stuff now too. Because I know you want to focus on the photography stuff, which is cool, and I don't mind helping with that, but your drawings and your sketches are gonna help you so much too. Like, I mean, Jared, you can talk about that a little bit. Like, even those basic exercises that you do, and they may seem dumb at the time, they have an impact on your work later. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, how you render things, and like, for instance, like, sketching the light, like, sit there and draw in here over and over and over again because like when you have to go in and model like a human head or something like that you need to know how to render it and not just that focus you've like mastered a lot of those fundamentals like if you look at character design the fundamentals of that character proportionally are the same like the hands to the legs like at, at roughly the same spot, like the, the torso might be bigger or smaller or, you know, proportions change overall, but you see like where, how they relate to each other. I, I, it, those fundamentals is what makes it way to blend and, and allows the artist to kind of take it to what they want. Yeah, for sure. 
So you're, you're saying there's the same underlining fundamentals of people that do maybe the same type of work, but they have completely different styles, but the same fundamentals are there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, okay. <clears throat> um, I guess I have a question for, for all of you, because you all are um, artists. Um, and I don't mean that in a, in a no, mean I, way. No, I just, that's, I mean. the, yeah. Um, so I, I saw it specifically with Jace, like when he started going, like his, um, started his art classes earlier this year, he de like, I saw you definitely like you hated doing the sketches and the basic kind of stuff. Um, but now I see like your, your final projects and things like that. you definitely seem to have like, it's kind of escaped like being an assignment and it's something that you're more or less passionate about. Um, did you guys all kind of encounter that throughout school? Like at first it's like, oh God, here's another class or an assignment, but you just, because it's what you're driven to do, you kind of like just innately become passionate about it and want it to be the best product that it can be. Yeah. I mean, you, you saw me getting it. There was some days like I would get so frustrated because I would have to do a painting and then I'd pull the tape up. And even though I stuck it to my leg and tried to get as much of uh, the residue off so that it didn't rip my paper, and then when I finally finished with my product, and I rip my paper, and it's just like, I just spent three hours doing this, and I'm about to lose my mind because I have to redo this little portion all over again. I have to go back and try to rematch this paint, which is a pretty long guessing game, and it's you get to this point where the fundamental parts come in and it makes life a lot easier for you, you know, cause I can look at a, you, know, you can look at a paint now and, and be like, okay, I, I know the ballpark of how to get there. And then it's trial and error once you get to the basic idea of it. Yeah, I would agree. Um, my personal one was like, cause I, so in our high school, we had kind of a, a pretty good art program that was like, there was a track. And I remember I always wanted to be an art AP because the art AP students got to do all the cool stuff. But you had to go through art honors first. And to get into art honors, you had to take so many art classes. So, like, when I was a freshman, I wanted to be an art AP. But there were all these other prerequisites you had to take to get there to do the fun stuff. And, like, as much as it sucked, it still helped me because then when I did get the art AP, I had the abilities to actually take advantage of RDP for what those advantages were. And Jarb, you can elaborate on your your experience. Dude, you got a way better memory than me, I'm not gonna lie. Like, <laughs> but I'm like trying to think, I'm like, man, what <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I think if you <laughs> asked me anything academically from high school it'd just be a high school I'd be like I remember the RT name because I made fun of her a lot. That was about it. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, but Jared, you've also had way more experience in that field. You know, after art or after high school, I went on to study science for eight years, and I don't remember shit of that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I guess we kind of pick, we got to force out the other stuff to make room for new things. But yeah, sure. so I have to with mine. I have to kind of come from a different angle because I'm the only one of the the four of you who has no formal training. Get out. So I've never gone to any level for my art or whatever. Um, so I come at it from a different angle in the fact that like I can speak to this a lot with when I started producing music. I did that because I had an incredible passion to do it. Um, and at the time I had no means to learn. So I self-taught um, and so for me, it was, I wanted, you know, I'd listen to songs and I wanted that final product and I would work at it. And yeah, you get frustrated when nothing comes out how you want or how you think it should sound. Um, but part of the joy for me was the journey of discovering how to make sounds and how to do a good mix. And, and now I'm finding that more with, uh, videography and cinematography is that I'm, you know, I want to have a good final product, but I'm having a blast figuring out what a good composition is and what a bad composition is or um, how to do basic color grading instead of just 
maxing out contrast and saturation or putting a LUT on or something, you know, yeah. like give the subtle nuances. Um, and so for me, it's kind of opposite where I never, I never really like resented learning the, the basics because I actually had to go seek them out for myself. Um, because I was like, well, I know that I have to learn them in order to get the product I want. And so it all kind of like was hand in hand for me. Um, well, I think okay. it's, what, what you just made was a good point, And I think it speaks to what Jarvis is even talking about now. Like, uh, cause even now, you know, we make a living doing this, but that doesn't stop our learning. Jarvis is learning a new, what, what are you learning now, Jarvis? Um, so right now I'm just kind of fiddling around with Unreal a little bit, just kind of wrapping my head around like game engines. And I figured I'd take the artist approach to that stuff just because I have, you know, experience as a 3D artist. Um, and then as I learn how to use it, that's how I make tools is I try to make tools for the artists, you know, and if you don't know how to use it as an artist, well, you'll probably be a shitty tool. Sorry, yeah, you can, yeah, you can say whatever you want. Yeah. No, but so I, so I think that what you, the point you just made Vlad, was perfect. It's like you, I think we almost resented it because it was a formal structure and we didn't get to choose it, you know, where you got to hand pick it. But I think it's interesting because now that's basically what we do. Like I obviously, none of us are like masters of everything. So we're still constantly learning you know, about our crafts and trying to search out that new piece of information to make the better product that we want to create. Yeah, I mean, how, yeah, I mean, how much of it do you, like, regardless of whether you have formal training or education or whatnot, like, how much of it do you feel is just, you know, that, that own self-teaching, that own, like, pursuit of it outside of a classroom or outside of a book? Um, 90%. Yeah, I was going to say, I that's the most like, important. Yeah, I've met guys like uh, uh, my buddy George, who's actually from Serbia. Uh, he was published in one of the older Autodesk books, I think around like 8.3, in one of the later ones. But completely self taught 3D artist, phenomenal photographer, just hands down. He just he understood how it all worked. And then he was able to like, you know, it's kind of like when you, if you look at something and then you sketch it or draw it, you know what I mean? You're rendering that through your hand from your eye. And he just understood photography and how light painted and just could transmit all of that through the software and kept the pump artist. Hmm. That's insane. Yeah, and just like as an example too, like you gotta remember that my art training ended at high school. Like my photography after high school was all self-taught, and honestly, like the thing that that I learned, where I learned the most amount of information was when I took it upon myself and I found a studio in Cleveland to go intern with and learn from. And they didn't pay me when I first started. I just showed up every single day to help them out. Cause I wanted to learn. I was like, I didn't care if I had to mop the floors, if it meant that I got to learn something that day. And eventually they hired me on as the, the studio assistant. But the point is like, that's where I learned the most information. It wasn't a classroom. It was a working studio. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. it's that gumption to go out and look for that information that makes you better. Because what you learn in school is again, it's fundamentals. That's the whole point of it. it. You're there to learn that and then take that out to the world and turn it into your own stuff. So what people can really yeah, totally. take away from this is that it's 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 about getting that getting that education on the streets, right? Mm. The school of hard knocks. Yeah, Speaking of streets, Jeff, is there uh, like a police car outside the house? Because you were just like going right. No, right I see right. that, but I don't. I, it might be the ghost. I don't know yeah, because I, I see know. the I same just, thing. I've been seeing that for a minute, and I was just like, "What is going on over there?" Yeah, yeah no, I. There's no cops. There's nothing. I think. Uh, oh shit! No, I'm pretty sure I know the answer. Uh, Jar, 
I'm just like hacked into Facebook and put a, a blinking filter <laughs> over your cam. Mm. Hey. He gives me way too much credit. I like it. <laughs> okay, Jarvis, I have a question for you again. Too, no. Too bad, Alex. <laughs> Kicking you out. Alright, drinking left. Alright, it's fine. Yeah, it's a funny Like, let me get my job here real quick. I'm checking out that. Good lord. Uh, it's not a gallon of white Russians. <laughs> gallon of white Russians, alright. Yeah. Alright, anyway. Alright, so I know you've worked on Hollywood films. Can you name a couple that you've worked on? And then I want to know, like, what your favorite your favorite product that you produced for a film is? So the majority of the features, actually the features that I've worked on um, were my first job. Um, I just kind of, I was graduated and needed a job, so I just packed up my truck and just drove to LA. And nice. luck, I was, you know, one of the lucky ones, I guess. But um, no, I, I started out as a stereo like a roto artist for stereo version. And uh, it was on Harry, the last Harry Potter and Green Lantern. Oh. And uh, yeah, from there, I guess like my career has been kind of all over the place as far as like I've done advertising stuff, I've done configurator work. We've, it's, it's always kind of like a new adventure. Um, yeah. So it hasn't been anything like really standard, like I do feature films or I do television, you know? Yeah. Like, okay. Everything so is, is that kind of like a freelance space that you can bounce around a lot? Or are you, what are you, what is it, what are you doing exactly? What's. So as an artist, you will generally freelance. Um, if you're in the, like, television or film world. It's a little bit more steady when you get into games, um, just because the nature of, you know, the product life cycle of a game is just longer. Um, whereas a television series, you know, you could be every two weeks, you're turning over episodes. And it's, it's a lot faster paced. It's, but it, it's a really great place to like, especially kind of cut your teeth because you learn how to work quickly, being around other people that can, you know, efficiently do that. And, you know, it's, it's where you find, like, a lot of really talented people. I mean, you know, not just feature films, but also television production as well. Yeah. So, that answer your question. Yeah. yeah. Part of it? <laughs> All right, so the next question. Okay. You said you're working on learning Unreal, like Correct. Unreal Engine? Yes. Okay. So what is that like? A, it's like a side hobby. Like you're interested in learning how to uh, create games or, or do the art for games. Or can, can you explain that a little bit to me? So as graphic, so primarily rendering. Uh, you know, going from the process of going from three D three dimensional scene to a two D image um, has been primarily heavy on the CPU. Yeah. Well, now we have RTX cards and we have GPUs that are powerful enough to handle what in real time. So the industry, especially since COVID-19 is happening, a lot of industry or a, a lot of the film and television is, I think, going to leverage more game technology because it it's just faster. Uh, and the man like Mandalorian is a is a great example of that. If you, if you ever want to check out like scenes that great stuff. Yeah, the Mandalorian's so, awesome. So they were using game engines to to help make some of the three D three D art in that show? So what they've been doing is starting to have I guess it's like immersive sex, you could say. So, because it's all real time, the set is, I guess, a, the game ending. You know, you're, it's seen in the end. Right? Okay. You have 
your whole environment, you have your life, and because you're in a set projecting that, you're going to get accurate reflections. You're going to get um, the lighting is going to be projected onto your character without you having to do a bunch of relighting in post production. Right. You know, wow. right. making it is like making it integrate into. You know, so, Jar, I have another question too. Just going back to like the actual work that goes in behind the scenes when you're uh, doing 3D work, you know, with your skins and your your rigs for characters and props and stuff. Could you elaborate a little bit more uh, on like just the back end work of that? Because I know it's not like you don't just pull up a rendering program and move some sliders around like there's programming that I, I'm assuming you guys do like for your pipelines to get you know the the rigging from the guy that does the motion to the guy who does the color to the guy who does the textures and all that back end stuff that no one really ever sees so so what what I do is because I'm like a I'm a pipeline TV slash software developer, we try to take the tedious tasks out of the artist's day. So they get to spend more time doing the artwork that they like to do. Um, so when you open a scene, you know, we want everything we built from in our production database. We want your plates to come in so you know you don't have to go hunt for footage to bring in your team. We want the outputs to be set. Pretty much as much as we can. We want to make artists' lives easier so that they can do what they do. Because, right, like before this, there was just so much that, like, there's just a lot that you would have to do if you were doing 3D, you know, animation, like, way back when, especially if it was incorporated with real life actors, right? Like, it, it's mind boggling like, how much time it actually takes to do good CG. Yeah, I mean, Good CG kind of speaks for itself. You can't, if you don't see it, then they did a great job. Um, nothing really ever comes out of CG perfect. Always goes through post production as well. Um, and a compositor, their job is to take that and blend that into the footage, match film grain, make sure that. You know, as a bright light passes behind something, it wraps around, you know, your, your character. Or, you know, just a lot of the nuances that really finesse it into the scene and what makes it, you know, you see. Yeah. But, um, and that attention to detail, too, just come, kind of comes right back full circle to why are you doing what you're doing? You know, like, it's... Like you said, when you see good CG, you don't really even think about it as CG. But when you see bad CG, you're like, that's horrible. You know, and it's that attention to detail that you don't even realize that when you see it, you you just know it's good, but if you don't see those little minute details, it just it blows it and you're like, that's horrible. But to be fair, it's not always on the artists. Um, sure. You know, sometimes at the end of the day, we are the client's paintbrush, right? We get we get paid to do our job, but it ultimately is the client's decision. They want something to look a certain way. That's a call that they make, and it's our job to do meet the client's expectations and do the best job. Yeah, and it's it's always a balancing act. Yeah. So I watch on YouTube, I watch this channel um, called Corridor Crew. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. Yep. It's, uh, they're like a VFX company, I think. Um, they do YouTube channels and stuff too. But they had this series um, where they take really bad old CG and they try to make it better with new technology. And the one I watched was the Scorpion King. And that's like... Probably the worst one I can think of, but I, you know, but it's just crazy, you know, like they've done everything down 
in layman's terms, and I'm still like barely catching on to what they're saying. But then you see like the product after all, everything they're talking about, and you're like, holy, like so there's so was, much to go into this. <laughs> it's insane. Was there a big difference between the two? Yeah, there was because like, and they have. It sounds like they have to render for almost like every element. So like, they did like skin touch-ups and, and made his skin more realistic and less like doll-like. And then it sound, I, if I'm remembering correct, they had to like render it that way. And then once it was that way, they would go in and they would add like, um, they would add like some sort of a flickering light to match the torch that he was supposedly holding because there was no like weird, and, and they go into like all this stuff about how how skin really reacts to light and and how porous it is and, and the way that it just gets absorbed and how you can shine a flashlight through like this part of your skin and they go into all that and they're like you have to make it as real as possible yeah. and all of that is like little baby steps that take forever to render out and make a final product it's just it blows my mind sometimes their videos on this little subject take days because of rendering time. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, subsurface scattering is, is definitely something that's going to make it more real. And But the reason they put it into like a multi-pass DXR is when all of that gets to the compositor, it gives them more freedom to really dial in what needs to be adjusted. Mm. Um, you know, the 3D artists, they, they do a great job and they take it in a good situation, like 90% of the way, and that extra 10%, if the compositor did a great job, you won't know that they did the job. So, so you're saying that what, what I just explained that they were doing, that's compositing? Um, so, yeah, essentially they trying to match it to the scene, right? Yeah. Okay. Wow. But the 3D artist will have, like, they'll have a backplate, and they'll try to get the lighting, like, really close, and it'll it'll almost look pretty spot on. Yeah. But then, yeah, yeah that finishing artist, they take it to the next level, for sure. Nuts. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, but that's why we watch it. <laughs> exactly. It's pretty so, cool. So yeah. what are your main programs that you that you used for 3D rendering and <laughs> I mean know the words. You know what I'm saying though, right? What do you use to make shit yeah, look awesome? awesome? Yeah, what do you do to make shit awesome? <laughs> um, well, definitely like a team thing. If you don't have a good team, it's, it's a good part. But, uh, so primarily Maya is what I'm the most comfortable with. Um, I've used 3ds Max in the past. I've used Lightwave. Uh, prefer not to use Lightwave. Sorry, Lightwave guys. <laughs> Reference. Fine, um, dude. I don't know what any of these are so far. <laughs> just, just in case you get kicked back. I <laughs> also, Jeff, Jar's starting like a world war in our comment section. We're completely oblivious right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have to reply to the comments on this one because I'm so far detached from this subject. I'll be like, hey, shut up. Stop yelling. Stop yelling. What you guys do with the backlash? So yeah, so primarily for 3D, it was Maya for me. And then for post-production, like I started with Shake, and I started kind of moving into Nuke when it was like early on, and then the Foundry took it over, and yeah, Nuke is pretty much what I I did the majority of my content. And just for just for reference, can you explain a little bit like what Nuke is like, uh, and try can you put it in perspectives of comparing it to something like. Uh, Premiere Pro, because I think most people would understand if you're comparing it to Premiere Pro. How about After Effects? All right, After Effects. Okay. So, so Nuke is a node-based compositor where After Effects is layer-based, right? So imagine if each one of your 
that you weren't bound to like this, right? You know how you pre-comp things in After Effects? Imagine if you had, instead of layers, you had a tree. Mm -hmm. And each of those layers could, could be a node. Like a constant layer is a constant node. And then you just plug things into each other and, you know, you're See, up. I, I understand that because I, I'm a huge advocate of DaVinci Resolve and their node base in their okay. coloring, and their node base in their um, fusion, which is like their 3D rendering. Um, mm -hmm. But I've only, you know, just scratching the surface, I won't even like begin to understand half of the tools that they offer you. And this isn't even like professional grade software. Like it is for coloring, but not for what you're doing. Well, I mean, Fusion, Fusion is a great product. Like, there's no doubt about it. Um, I've used Fusion in the past, and it, it definitely holds its own. Um, especially that render. It, it is a fast render. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I always advocate, advocate play. Even if you don't know how to use something, like, open up, like, download Blender. It's free. 2.8 is actually pretty similar. Like, I would okay. say, I'm docked. It's... It's dangerously solid. <laughs> um, they have like a using that epic funded funding. But yeah, just you know, make something. Just even if it's a a soda can, and just move things around and turn on as many outputs as you can, and just render out an EXR with as many layers as you can, and then so and then when you bring it into Hit the fusion, take it apart, and put it back together, and you can make, if you put it back together, it match exactly like you brought it in. Because if you can do that, then you can start manipulating individual layers to into the game. Because you want to be able to like, adjust the subsurface only, or adjust the reflections only. You know, maybe you want it to be a little bit more blue or a little bit more red, and that's to set it in the scene. Wow. So I think cool. we have a new project. Let's but make us. I got blood to go. So. Yeah, make a Natty Light commercial. <laughs> oh, I already. I made a UFO. She did. It was, yeah, it was super simple because all you have to do is get like a circular rig and you just kind of pull it and stretch it and move it until you get the UFO looking thing. That's cool. So yeah. Okay, so Blender is free. Yep. And that's something good to like dip your toes in. Absolutely. You but don't you have the overhead of Autodesk software yeah. or and it's like I'm people have different views on things. I don't think software should be as expensive as it is. I understand a lot goes into the tools. But I think when it's overpriced, or, yeah, you're just hurting artists, you know? Yeah. So I have a question then. If, because I'm, like, I'm thinking about this in terms of uh, Jason's drawings right now. Like, what, take what we just talked about in 3D, and, like, how would we help Jace? For, like get better with his sketches and drawings and scenes and photography composition and stuff like that based off what you were just saying in terms of like playing like well what, what do you think would be a good idea for him to like take as like a little personal project for him to to play with so you've done a comp i know you've done a comp because we've talked about doing comps right Thanks. what no, I'm, I'm talking i'm talking about oh, me guys. yeah i'm not a comp Okay, same thing. If you take your 3D object and just comp it into a picture, just start with, it doesn't have to move, right? Because if you can do it on one frame, there's no reason you can't do it on your So there you go, Jace. Looks like I got to comp something. I'm so lost in something. <laughs> oh, you're not as lost as I am. Are you so sure yeah, you that? Yeah, for damn sure. I dabbled for once, and like, dabbled over here, just like, I have no idea what's happening. Like, these cops are really... <laughs> do your... Hey, kids, don't forget to do your comps. 
if you want to be successful. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Christ. Oh, shit, Gab, you do comps, too. It's called editing your writing. Oh, look at that. I'm, I'm back in the group now, boys. Yeah, back. You're the man. <laughs> <laughs> so bad you. Yeah, but you just play with stuff. There's a billion buttons, it seems like, in these packages. So just, you know, click all of them. Find out what they do. And then click them with intent. So here's another question, too. <laughs> with... with I know there's a sense of like playing with stuff, but do you recommend watching YouTube videos or do, would you recommend like picking up a book that actually talks about the specific subject? Or I'm, so it, everybody learns differently and you know, you, everybody here might learn a, a different way for me. Like I have to watch it and then I have to write it down then I have to do it. So I have to do all three to, to kind of like cement it into memory, right? Um, to where I can, I can reference it pretty quickly. But once you understand, and like we talked about the fundamentals, once we talk, like once you understand what the fundamentals are, like you know what you're shooting for. Sorry, copy. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, well, I mean, once you know what you're shooting for, just you know, and, and you can like explore how to get there. You know, take farming, right? I'm like, crap. I have a water problem. I have to figure out how to fix that. How do I fix the water problem? I go look up how to fix water problem. And they go get the big ass tractor. I'm like, crap. <laughs> How many tractors do you have? Uh, three. Okay. How old are they? Um, Massey Ferguson is from 2000. That's our new. Uh, we have another one. I think it's like a Ford from. Uh, it's maybe like the seventies. Then we have a Dutz. What? Dutz. 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 Uh, yeah. Oh, it's great. It's got brown hair. Oh, boy. My uh, my uncle he collected tractors, and I saw his collection a few years ago again, mm -hmm. and he had a one hundred year old tractor that oh. he got to run. Really? Was, yes. <laughs> I don't know how the dude's <laughs> insane, but he he got it running and he fired it up just so we could see it. I want to have that kind of time on my hands where I can make yeah, a hundred year old tractor. I was only at, at tractor money. I didn't know that. <laughs> I want to have money that I can throw away at a hundred year old tractor. He lived in a cabin, like over a lake, and then on the other side of the street behind him, he had a huge warehouse full of tractors. I mean, yeah. what, what, what did he do in life? Because honestly, that's the that's the level I need to get to. Actually, yeah. it's kind of interesting. He did all his comps. Set builder for Hollywood. Okay. Oh, well, see, that's how you get tractor money. You have to go to LA. That's the only way it happens. Yeah. Is this is this the real American way right here? You you get involved in you get involved in Hollywood, buy some tractors. That's a real American dream right there. Yeah, yeah, dude. I'm not the city life. I've had enough of this big city living, brother. I'm, I'm buying tractors. <laughs> Just like my forefathers before me. Oh, that's awesome. oh. oh, yeah. But yeah, make an Unreal and be a set builder. Exactly. All the tractors you want, man. All the tractors. <laughs> I can't yeah. wait. Do we not take 20 minute stops anymore? Is that not a thing? That, we only do that when we're in person and we have a set recording time. Ah, so, yeah, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. You guys are really uh, making me have to milk this drink over here. <laughs> Dude, you can get up at any time and get another drink. Yeah. It's okay. Well, that's not well, yeah, I like to get a bottle before I started. <laughs> See, okay. I was like, I don't know how long it's going to be, man. I saw one oh, that was 
What's up? Not everybody can leave at once. <laughs> yeah, no. I can think of everybody's like, all right, bye. I know. That's hilarious. <sighs> what do you think, Jab? It's running through your head. It's running through my head. I um, I'm just trying to kind of more or less observe and, and take notes, really, because I'm actually I'm really intrigued with with visual arts. It's just not. It's not where I invest my time, you know what I mean? But I love talking to Alex and Jace and you, like, so I'm just, I'm just more or less, the only thing that really threw me off for a second is when you guys started talking about, was it Unreal Game Engines or something? I was like, all right, I'm fucking, I'm out, like, yeah. but no, it's cool. Uh, I mean, I'm right there with you. I'm barely hanging on. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, then, then ask him a really technical problem. Yeah, I, I, I know I can get. So I can get. <laughs> so I, uh, so I and everyone else, everyone else and I. And no, that's how I feel half the time when I ask Jarvis a question, because, and I mean that in a positive way. But like, I remember one time I was asking him about setting thresholds and like basically clipping things based on thresholds. And Jarm gave me like a 15 minute explanation, which at the time went right over my head. And it only took me two years later to figure out exactly what he was saying. <laughs> only two years. So how long? Yeah, it, only because I was playing with it and trying to figure it out. It, it only took me two years to figure it out. I'm sorry guys, I'm not, I'm not a great speller, but here's like your intermission. You guys want another drink? <laughs> dude, that is that is why you paid the big bucks exactly. right there, dude. Exactly. Yeah. You know how long you were taking to draw something like that? <laughs> I've, I've, I've been up there for 20 minutes being like, how's that popcorn look again? Hold like, on. <laughs> oh, I kind of want to see. Can pull out a piece of paper, Jay. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Actually, everybody do it. Everybody, everybody draw an intermission? Everybody makes an intermission sign. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Wait, what is it? It's popcorn? I, I don't know. I mean, I drew popcorn. We can take a little further, you know. We can, we can get some stripes in there. I know what I'm doing. There we go. Yeah. Really, really render it. Now, do you believe, right, I guess there's a question on this, when you were drawing, do you believe in the purity of a line? I commit wholly to the line because I like to use a lot of dashed lines in my drawing. It looks like I just scratched the hell out of it, and that's what I like to do. I mean, so line weight is definitely, you know, plays into like a, a style that you're going for. It's definitely something that you, you take into consideration when you're trying to like maybe illustrate something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, yeah. What? What was Go your back. question again? So when the last drawing class I had, yeah. um, which was like, that was the semester before this one, um, my teacher never wanted you to like stop on one line, you know, like commit to the line completely. And I like to use a bunch of dashes to create whatever I'm doing. Okay. But that's just the stuff. All my pieces have the same like style to it. Like if I draw a head, I've made that head out of like you know fifty lines or so. That's I. I think that's what I do too. But see, here's the thing: is here's my I understand. Head. I understand what she's referring to, but I think you can use your dash lines as either a style. Or you could use that as like your preliminary sketch that if you wanted to go for like a really clean line, so you do your dash line drawing first, and then you draw over top of it with your solid clean lines to smooth it out if that's what you wanted to do. Well, I, I think also like having organic lines can easily portray things like motion or, you know, like whatever you're trying to like portray, you know, like, okay. There are artists that stipple. Yeah, yeah, stippling is really fun. I did that with ink and brush, and it, it gets almost frustrating in a way. What is stippling? It's like dots. It's like dots, yeah. Oh, man. Dots you do. 
and it takes forever. It, yeah. it looks cool. so long. But if you get a, if you get a really good soundtrack, like it's almost like meditating. Really? I mean, I I'd cramp. My hand would totally drunk. cramp. Huh? My hand would cramp so bad. <laughs> over and over. That's that's the pain they talk about in art, man. <laughs> it's a lot of blood, sweat, tears, and cramped fingers. You guys, I only have the bowl. That's that carpal tunnel. Popcorn's gonna be really hard. You got, I mean, there was like what was there? There was like the the hot dog, and then the soda the soda cup. They were damn. Yeah. Good. I actually have these on my refrigerator. I don't, I don't even know why I drew it. I just go off the fridge. <laughs> Here. Well, let's see. Reference. Oh, yeah, this is great. My guy's tripping on a rock, so he's like falling over a little bit. Not that he even looks up. What's up? <laughs> yes, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Uh, my popcorn does not look good. Yeah, no, they know we had models over here. <laughs> yeah, man, <damn> reference. <laughs> Jesus, yes, I'm so happy you have that. <laughs> okay, it's getting a little higher. You said, I don't know. It's really committing. I, 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 yeah, I'm all done. My popcorn. Oh, I'm not committed. I suck. He's just running. He's chilling. He's tripping. I drew a cactus. This could be awkward. We're all just looking down for five minutes. I don't know if that looks like a cactus, but that's what it's supposed to be. It's a cactus. and cactus. At the, at the, at the, <laughs> Go get your cactus at the intermission. That's what you get for talking through the movie. Don't they make like cactus after the scene? Could do this. It's true. I do don't. I feel like that's that where agave comes from. We can make food from cactus. So yeah. sure, you could sell cactus products. Well, actually, they make they make tequila out of. Cactus, uh, the flowers on cacti. Hot uh, uh, damn. Uh, All right, my drawing skills have definitely severely diminished over the years, but here, here's my effort. You can see okay, he's got some popcorn in his mouth because he's eating his own popcorn, and this is butter. He's nice eating sloppy butter, but he's running, so it's going all over the place. So he's just <laughs> taking handfuls of his brain and just like, mm. yeah. The yeah. mental image I got from that is like, like when you know how Gavin said like eating it is like you monsters. <laughs> Stop <laughs> it! We're one of you. Does it just go back in in like the pop? It just just yeah. dude. Just you can like, smell that idea no, no, to uh, Adventure no. time. Oh wait, hold on. Let me let me. Finish this drawing. I'm using our dog's paw and his nails to get my knee. My hands look like. Did you just call him Nard Dog? <laughs> no, our dog. Oh, I thought you said Nard Dog. Okay, so yeah. actually, when he's done eating the popcorn, it it poops out onto the ground, and that's what you get when you put popcorn on your lap. It gets all oily after the movie. You oh. got those stains on it. It's the popcorn was pooping on you. I've never had that happen. You've never had that before, where you like at the end of a movie, you get like if you have really buttery popcorn, it'll like leak out of the bag. Some greasy shorts. Yeah, yeah. it's never fun. Because you're all—it's always when you're like invested in the movie too, and then you stand up and you're like, "What the fuck? This has been greasing like for the last two hours." God damn it! You walk out of this. Right, here we go. You're yeah, you're like, no, I look ridiculous. I hate this movie. That looks great. Oh damn! Nice. Oh dude, oh, I like that. His he's doing like a little. He's got a little flair to his step. He's like, I'm getting some pop. That's yeah. right. <laughs> he's dancing on his way over there. He's not just rubbing. Now, Alex, uh, your popcorn guy looks like he has it diarrhea. Could have been a bad choice. <laughs> I feel like it. Well, I guess part of this goes back to what Alex told me. Do you, Do you believe? There's a direct relation between any of the art forms. Like I, I'm not very interested in drawing, so I don't give it my full commitment. You know, 
I, I'm in the photography program, so how and I understand the basics of knowing lines and understanding how you know you have vanishing lines and you have lines that will point to add emphasis and you'll have these things. Are those the key things to take away, or is it imperative that you're good throughout all the art forms? I mean. I would say, like, it's just a different tool, right? You still have to maintain composition. You still have to understand your lighting. You still have to understand what you're trying to portray. It's just a different way to go about it. Like when you use a camera versus a pencil. Mm -hmm. I think it's a different tool, and it'll give a different result, obviously. You know, it's difficult to take a pencil and make a picture, obviously. But, uh, yeah, I would say a lot of the fundamentals still apply. Like, if your composition's off, doesn't your picture suffer? Yeah. Okay. Well, same thing if you're, you know, doing a landscape or doing a matte painting, like for film or something like that. You know, if your composition is, is poor, then the overall will suffer. Fundamentals. Yeah. yeah, and uh, honestly, like, there's still some effort, or not effort, but uh, some overlay, too, just because uh, when you get to the more advanced Photoshopping techniques to, like, bring out highlights and stuff, uh, you're basically drawing on top of your photograph. You know, it's not a pencil, it's a tablet, an electronic tablet, but, you know, you may be painting in more highlights or, uh, you know, brightening up a shadow, but you got to understand why you would brighten up that shadow in the first place, because you don't want to, you know, you, you don't want to brighten up a shadow under someone's armpit to the same level that the shadow under their eyes would be, you know, so there's still some, like, transition of those types of skills like even if your drawings aren't great what you're learning is like where would shadows fall you know how do they fall those types of things because that's going to transfer to how you edit your photograph too yeah i think that's really smart when it comes to photography <clears throat> it's like understanding just how light works is a big thing too it's the biggest thing. I would say, like, if you don't understand how light works, it doesn't matter if you're a natural light photographer or a strobist or constant light, whatever it is. Like, you need to understand how light works to produce the results you want. Yeah, same applies to 3D, too. Like, a lighting artist is valuable. Like, their eye and understanding, like, how everything should be laid out is is what makes things look the way it does. Because if, if you don't have that going into a comp, like you have a, a scene that's lit poorly, it's, it's a lot of work really kind of turn it around. Yeah. So. so recently I was working on a project um, and I was trying to overlay 3D text into a, a real scene and make it look believable, like it might have been floating there. And uh, so I'm looking up tutorials, looking up all kind, like, you know, articles, <laughs> anything I can find. I'm finding some stuff. Uh, specifically, I'm like, I want to do this in Fusion because that's what I'm editing in and all this stuff. So I start to learn how, and I'm, I'm tracking the scene so that I can essentially anchor this 3D word into the scene, right? Mm -hmm. And then... And then they introduce the fact that you you have to you have to introduce artificial light into the real scene because your artificial letters won't show up without the light. Yep. And I like what? Like I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. And so I start playing around with it, and it looked really bad. <laughs> it was really really bad. <laughs> Is that, is that like the entry to a movie, like when the title will pop up, you have to have the correct lighting essentially on the title inside of the what is going on in the background as well? Well, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. If you want to make it like 
fit your scene and not stick out like a sore thumb, you have to try to match it. So like in my case, I was outside and there was like street lights everywhere. And so I tried to match the lights in my virtual space to be where I think the real lights were in my physical space. Mm. And I record. So there's actually um, a good software for that. It's not super expensive, but if you want to get into it, match moving is a whole career in the 3D field. Um, and a good tracking artist is, is actually a really, really important thing to have as well. Obviously, the whole everything is really important. But, um, yeah, matching matching your 3D to your scene is, is a big deal because you have to compensate lens distortion. Um, yeah. And kind a of morphic lens, you know. So, yeah, download Synthize. Synthize? I gotta look not, up. It's not super crazy and has some, uh, has some pretty great stories on there. You'll enjoy oh, please, do, after. please do share. Uh, I like synthesis was what I think was like one ago, but it's still used today in industry. One, it's it just does a great job for not a lot of money. So Okay. I'll look that up. I have like I have like five windows open on my other browser. <laughs> I was like, what do you use? Okay, let's look it up. <laughs> I have a I have an unrelated question. Um could it potentially be the fan that's making it look like I'm having a rave in this house right now? Maybe. Uh, like a ceiling yeah. fan? Like, could that be doing that to the yeah. light? Well, it's too hot to turn the fan off, so we're just going to have to rock that well, out. <laughs> I've just been, I've been looking around. Every time I look at myself in the screen, I'm like, what is, like, what is causing that? Are the police here? Like, have I done something? And then I finally noticed that there's a massive ceiling fan right there, and that's where all the light is coming from. Uh, so I want to bring this back to uh, kind of the idea of intentionally doing something, and it goes along with what you were just talking about, Seth. But when – shit, I forgot my thought. Never mind. <laughs> What? Man, that was a that was a great <laughs> intro as well. Like you were like, I have a formulated question. I've been waiting to ask this, but no, no, okay, no, I remember. I remember my thought was, uh, I, I brought up a video that Peaches sent to me that he was like, this could be real, maybe not, and I ran it by Jet or Jarv to see what his thoughts were in terms of CGI, and he brought up a really interesting point, which is when you're doing CGI within a frame. Um, Physics doesn't leave that frame. So, like, if you're doing something to an object 3D wise, CG wise, like, you have to remember that physics, to, to pull it off, physics still applies in that world that you're creating with CGI. Well, you have to make the physics. Okay, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you could potentially have something like a founding box, right? Where the physics inside, where you set like whatever's happening in that area, then outside of that, you can introduce forces and. But yeah, I mean, I think also like the resolution is. I don't know how you're gonna tell. You know, yeah. Tell me, pixelate everything and. Impressive. Yeah, and put it on Facebook and it's been compressed down and Yeah. But that that said, is there like when you go into an actual editing program, are there like dials where you can uh, like type in a force acting on a three D created object, or is that like that force only appears that way because of how you've tracked it through the frame? So anything is possible with enough time. So what you're saying is there are people like you that sit there and program out the frame physics frame. of what's happening within the frame? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're vision. So what you just described would be an effects artist. An effects artist, their, their world is physics, right? 
they want when something explodes, how does this explode? How do I make this look real? What is the wind direction? Um, is this plane moving at seven miles an hour? Is this plane moving at 700 miles an hour? Like all of these courses and stuff like that comes into, you know, and, and then obviously there is just artistic license. Yeah. So, <clears throat> So kind of kind of going off that, um, Alex, you had mentioned, you know, like those those pictures that go around the Internet, they just get compressed and, and used over and over and over again. And eventually it's just like this grainy image like, you know, is this guy holding a knife or his car keys? You know, like that kind of stuff. And it sparks these debates when an image has been passed around like that and compressed so many times. Is there, if you know what you're doing, can you, and I'm probably using the wrong terminology, but can you decompress that photo? Like, can you get it to a clearer, less altered I can, state? I can answer it from the science part of what I did when I was doing image research, which is the answer is if it's a JPEG that's been downsized and compressed, you basically, if you're trying to enhance it, all you're doing is taking artistic license. The, That's it. The CSI, like, in the yeah, yeah. yeah, like, is that is that even, like, where they're like, oh, hold on. And then it, like, oh, my God, you can see this person's face now. Yeah, yeah that, that doesn't exist. That's, that's not real. I got this now, reflection on the belt buckle. <laughs> yeah. Now, that, that said, if you, there's, like, uh, if, you, if you knew the camera lens, the camera make, there are ways to like enhance an image but it's like it's it's minute it's not it, it's you would probably only maybe gain like 10 percent more resolution out of an image it wouldn't make a distinguishing you wouldn't be able to distinguish it from any other object it would just be probably a little bit more resolution of the image but the the actual objects within the image aren't going to be any clearer hmm. Well, took the wind out of my sails. I don't even want to be a journalist anymore. Fuck that. Yeah, no, but like, you'd be surprised. Like, in, in <laughs> I'm about, out. No, like, when, even in crime scene photos, there's a 5% distortion between measurements of an image at the center of the, fro the photo to the edge of the photo, depending on, you know, what lens you have. Like, barrel distortion is real, and it affects measurements. So you need, like, when you're, you know, when it comes down to, like, taking scientific measurements, you need to know what your barrel distortion is so that you can account for that in your precise measurements. And that's, like, a whole thing. Like, there are programs out there, but they're developed by, like, literally physicists with PhDs who, for, like, hack, basically, camera lens manufacturers details to, like, plug in and measure. But, yeah, that's a thing. It definitely gets distorted. Sentai does a pretty good job of that. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that's the second I time. That's the second time you brought them up. This is not sponsored. Not sponsored. Synthize, give, give us money. Give us money. That's awesome. Yeah, but there's degradation too, like in JPEGs. The more you edit a JPEG, the more degraded it gets. But if you work with lossless files, you can play with those and still retain your information without degrading them, too. So talking about compressing, I want to tell you another story about me at work here. Someone, I made a, a video recently, and it was going to be sent out um, through email, um, through MailChimp, I guess. Yeah. And the person who was like putting it together, he's like, hey, Seth, is there a way that I could get that video of it? I want to send it through MailChimp. And I was like, sure. So I sent him the video, and it's like, I mean, it's like a minute long, and it's maybe 80, like 80 megabytes or something. And he's like, yeah, it says it's too big. I'm like, okay, well, how big does it need to be? And he's like, I think he said like two or three megabytes or smaller. Oh. So I was like, I try, but I'm pretty sure you don't want to see that. And so I actually did just because I wanted to see how bad it could actually get. And I got it down to, I think, two and a half megabytes. Was it, it was basically just like four blocks of colors that just 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, like, if yeah. you remember, like, if you've ever seen, like, old, like, flip phone footage, like, on the Motorola, uh, like, yeah. back in the day, and you're, like, <laughs> filming a video, and you think it's so high-tech and high-resolution, and then you look at it today, and you're, like, What's even happening? Yeah, it, look, <laughs> it looks like something that from a Nintendo that. 64. Like, <laughs> it's like less than 64 bit. It's awesome. Yeah, so he uh, he didn't use it. Needless to say. <laughs> God. So yeah. Like, yeah, it's not how it works. You can't just make things smaller and have good quality. No. God, I, I forgot about that, how terrible some of those, uh, like, those old cell phone videos and photos were. Like, a little while yeah. ago, I went and looked back, just for shits and giggles, went and looked back on, like, old parts of my Facebook, stuff I didn't even remember. Yeah. All those, like, cell phone pictures that are just, like, it looks like <laughs> there's just dirt in your camera. Every picture you've taken is just, like, what is that? Literally. <laughs> Is it even just with modern cameras, because the camera I had before the one I have now, like, in low light, that camera sucked. Yeah. It yeah. sucked. It, and, like, my $20 web camera right now, and the only thing lighting me is a Google web browser page off my computer screen, and it looks so much better than my quote-unquote professional camera from 15 years ago. <laughs> Hear that, Google? You do a great job of lighting. Give us money. Give us money. <laughs> Dude, whenever we do this, all I do is turn on all three screens to a Google page, and that's my lighting. You got three pages, like, Google. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have, like, credits of, like, all the software and, like, <laughs> just everyone we plugged in this, like, session. Well, actually, we, we, we all yeah, yes. put it in the description, but we never actually remember to do so. The last couple I've actually remembered to go through, because for a long oh, time, yes, go. Alex is absolutely correct. It was my idea. I was like, we'll do shout-outs at the end of every episode. And we would do them verbally, and then when I would post the video, I'd be like, good luck, everybody, we shout it out, because I forgot them for a long time. <laughs> but no, now, now I actually I actually go through and try and, um, especially like all the all the things you mentioned, just, just even if it's for resources for people that do watch it, you know? Yeah. Well, that's good, because Seth already has half those notes on his uh, browser. <laughs> yeah, dude, just send me a screenshot of your browser, and I'll just... I will. This is today's like, shout out. Bar. <laughs> uh, so I want to get into one more story real quick because I remember you talking about working on a video project that was like, was it a 24-hour or 48-hour film festival? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think we could end on that story. I think that'd be a good story to end on. Um, so... I'd never done a 24-hour film festival before, and we, we actually had like a really really good group of people. Um, so I did like the post work and the color grading. Um, my buddy Fernando, he did uh, pretty much he was like the director. Did, did a lot of cinematography stuff with a couple of other guys. And then we had like an editor, and the studio was nice enough to like over the weekend just give us their studio. What? So yeah. we were like, all right, we're good with this. <laughs> so we had like two crews filming at the same time, and then one person running hard drives back to the editor to start putting that together while I'm like taking specific shots that we like designated for post production, as far as like the people dilate and changing, like, you know, getting the color grading started. And, and it was just like, I used to take my dog to work, and they, I had a dog bed under my desk, and I slept there for like, <laughs> <laughs> when I did sleep. And, and then we had like, towards the end, we got down to like the last like five minutes. We had a car parked out front, just like in a no parking zone, just on. And we, we finally got like the, the DVD bird to just, out the door when they just heard like screeching tires and that was the end of it. But, <laughs> yeah, it was, That's they are awesome. awesome. reminded me a lot of like actual wholesale, like where the pressure of just 
holy crap, we have to make this whole thing in no time at all, and we have kind of no idea what the hell we're doing. But we get like a get a topic when like they announce, you know, like here's your topic. Um, then ours was on uh, like ESC and stuff. So it was like how this guy was handling like the war in Afghanistan and you know, his interaction with his daughter, how he's just like, yeah, it was like a super grueling thing. That I'm doing it. Damn. That's crazy. But I really want to try it. The 48 hour film festival. You sh everyone should try it. I doubt. Nothing else, just so you don't have to. Just so you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Just so it's one and done. Yeah, there's, there's, a group of, there's a group of people here I've been talking to about it. I'll get you. You and Jace can come down and do it. That's crazy, too, that they like. They, uh. They give you 48 hours, and then they're like, oh, here's your topic, the lighthearted subject of post-traumatic stress disorder. Have fun for the next yeah. two days. And you're like, like, pineapple. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you're like, oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm going to have a great time with this one. Yeah. <laughs> but, no, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. Like, at the end, like, you know, you're actually – Watching like everybody's forty-eight hour stuff and people are voting and I actually, like I think we got uh, I think we got like audience choice uh, like we didn't like win win to go on to like the next round but we got audience pick like two times in a row so that was kind of cool nice how did you get audience pick but not move on yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how they score things <laughs> <laughs> like everyone loved it. But <laughs> man, everybody loved it, but like literally nobody hated it. So you're not gonna make it. Yeah, <laughs> it's not about you today. You're going home. Yeah, it's rigged. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. But yeah, well, it's, it's I, yeah, for sure. I think oh boys, it is my bedtime. Oh yeah, it is. It is what about? <laughs> it is. Yeah, oh shit, it's it's eight thirty six. Jace has stayed up about two hours past past his prime, dude. I feel it. I he, needs to, he needs to he needs to get swaddled and go to bed. Yeah, dude, I love it. I love, I love it. I love going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so dude, he's. Good yeah, night, he's thick so boy, dude. <laughs> the horse dog yeah. is also asleep. He's done. Thank you. Horse dog. <laughs> well, cool. Well, hey, thank you so much for being on here, man. Um, I really appreciate yeah. it. Uh, do you do you have any um any other like shout outs? Any anything you want to just give give a little shout out to at all? Or have I mean I know you've already plugged. Like a ton of ton of stuff, but if you have anything else specifically you want us to um, put in the description, I'd be happy to do that for you. So, yeah, no, I mean, I think uh, I think we covered quite a bit, and and really, yeah, if best way to learn something is just go out there and do it. Cool. I love um, it. Okay. Seth, Seth, do you have any uh, do you have any shout outs? Anything you want to conclude with? I would just shout out Jarvis for being on here and answering all my questions. And shout out Jarvis. I had a lot of fun. It was sweet. Um, I didn't Al think of any other shout outs, so. Hey, it's all right. Alex, you got any? Top four. Yeah, Seth just stole mine. I was going to shout out Jarvis, but that's been taken now, so. Damn. <laughs> I guess I'll shout out the 48-hour film festival. <laughs> hey. Um. 24, because there's two, right? There's a 48-hour and a 24-hour, right? Maybe. I feel like there's two, but one of them. <laughs> well, hours, you know what? If there's hours. not, we're starting a 12-hour film festival. <laughs> fuck everybody. Oh, fuck. Um, <clears throat> the the shout-out I have is actually uh, Jace's uh, photography page, at Not Photography. We've never plugged that on here before, so check that out. Support the boy. Support the podcast. And uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks again for being on, Jarvis. 
Yeah, no problem, guys. Right. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thanks, Thanks, Bye. 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 I mean, that's a five-star call.